Well, what a way to start a morning. Good morning, everyone, and welcome, welcome to First Presbyterian Church of Copper's Cove worship service. We are glad that you are here. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. I pray that you have had a wonderful, wonderful Christmas celebration. We are still in the season of Christmas, and I still can wish you Merry Christmas. I hope that you are still enjoying the birth of our Savior and still celebrating with joy and peace in your heart. We are um, today um, going to be hearing a sermon from a wonderful scholar um, and preacher. His name is Dr. Rolf uh, Jacobson. He is professor of Old Testament and the Alvin and Rognes Chair of Scripture and Theology and Ministry at Luther Seminary in St. Paul, Minnesota. We are very, very grateful for his knowledge and his leadership. I have met uh, Rolf Jacobson. He is a uh, wonderful individual and highly respected uh, scholar and preacher. Um, he has published this sermon on a site called the Sermon for Every Sunday. Dot com, and I am very delighted that we were able to use this sermon today. Um, and this week I was able to um, take a little bit of a breath and um, be able to not prepare a sermon, but be able to with you enjoy it. So we look forward to that a little later on. Another announcement I'd like to call your attention to is the unhanging of the greens, which will be done on January 5th at 10 a.m. I'm almost a little sad to announce that because we have so enjoyed the beauty of our Christmas decorations as they have graced our sanctuary. I have enjoyed um, having them around me um, as I have been here in the pulpit. Um, and I want to thank all of those that have helped in making our Advent and Christmas celebrations so very wonderful. Um, I hope you were able to join in on the Christmas Eve service, um, I guess Thursday evening. Um, it was a different kind of service, um, being mostly virtual. There was a worship crew here, but it was mostly virtual. But, you know, it was still a very inspiring time because we were remembering that Jesus is here and Jesus is with us, and we could feel that even here, and I hope uh, you were feeling it in our virtual space as well. So I want to thank all of those that have worked so hard in making our Christmas celebration so wonderful. Um, we will um, be having ordination of elders on January 10th during the 11th, 11 a.m. service. I would invite you also to make sure to you are turning in, tuning in um, during that service as well. That will be a very special time. There will be no meeting of the older and youth, uh, young uh, um, youth uh, group uh, Bible study this evening, nor uh, on Wednesday, uh, December 30th. Other than that, I do not think I have any other announcements other than I do want to make a special thank you to all of you who um, contributed towards the gift for Mike and I. Uh, a moment of personal privilege. Um, it has been a hard year, and it uh, particularly meant a lot to us to receive the generous gift that you gave us. Um, I know um, I can speak also for the staff. I, I will publish the kind thank you note that Shannon has given. I know Sean feels the same. We are touched. Um, it has um, meant a lot that you are supporting us and encouraging us as we have um, worked through a year that has been challenging and it is um, it is always an honor to serve you but it has been particularly helpful to have you uh, recognizing the efforts that are made this year and uh, I just thank you I thank you with all my heart um, for your your generous support 
Um, I thank you also for all your cards and your phone calls and everything you've done this year. It, it has meant a lot. So thank you very, very much. Um, as we go forward this today, as we worship, we will be enjoying a hymn sing. Um, so we look forward to that as well. But let us prepare our hearts and our minds to do what we do best together, and that is to worship the Lord our God. Let us enter into the congregational introit singing Infant Holy, Infant Lowly. join with me in the call to worship. Praise the Lord. Praise God in the heavens. Praise the Lord from the earth. Young and old alike. Men and women together. Praise the Lord. Let us worship the Lord our God.
sing with all three verses of Good Christian Friends Rejoice. Oh, 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 oh,
Christ was born for this. Christ was born for this. Good Christian friends rejoice with heart and soul and voice. Now ye need not fear the grave. Jesus Christ was born to save. Calls you one and calls you all to gain the everlasting hope. Christ was born to save. Christ was born to save. Well, how fun was that? That was fun. Thank you, Shannon. Thank you, Gail. That was great. That was great. Our call to confession, trusting friends in God's grace, let us confess our sin before God and neighbor. God of wonder, you surround us with signs of your glory and surpass with your presence. Yet we often miss the marvels you place before us. Forgive our dullness and make us alert to the ways you make yourself known, that we might be witnesses to your good news and proclaim your extravagant love. We humbly offer our personal prayers in the silence. Friends, in Jesus Christ, God saved us, not because of any good works that we have done, but according to God's mercy, through the water of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. People of God then rejoice. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Well, boys and girls, I want to tell you today about my grandmother and my mother who used to fill my head with all kinds of wise sayings. Have you heard that word, sayings? They used to tell me a lot of things that, um, little phrases that you hold in your mind and you think to yourself now what does that mean and then after you give it some thought you realize boy that, that is, that's got some wisdom in it you know one of the things that I remember um, one of them used to say was a stitch in time saves nine and what that means is you know you need to do things when you're supposed to do them because if you don't do it at the right time, when it comes along, you end up probably having to do it later on, and you have to make up for things, and it takes you a lot more time to do it. You have to end up doing it and redoing it and maybe making up for mistakes that have come along because you didn't do it right. And then another one that I think was probably said to me by my mother, because sometimes on Saturday mornings I'd like to sleep in a little too long, she would say, if you spend your time sleeping, your dreams will not come true. And that was probably sort of self-explanatory. If you, if, you, if, you, if you don't get up and get going, the things that you have been dreaming about won't happen, because you're you're wasting your time. Another one that I know was said to me before I got married by my grandmother was, on every rose you will find thorns. And that was, that was something that was pretty wise. That was a wise saying, telling me that, you know, there's great things that happen in life. There's beautiful things that happen in life, but there's other things that just are part of life that, you know, that happen that aren't always good, but they're part of life, and that we need to take them and deal with them. Just like you rejoice in the good things, you deal with some of the things that aren't so good too. 
on every rose you will find thorns. And that's one of the reasons we have Jesus, because Jesus walks with us and helps us deal with some of those thorny things. But there was one phrase, one saying that I remember that really applies to the lesson today on our first Sunday in Christmas that I want to bring up to you. And I even brought um, an old pot. Oh, it's heavy. It's, it was Mike's grandmother's pot. It's an old, old cast iron pot. In fact, some of it might have been hand, um, hand forged, um, an old black pot. And um, the saying goes like this, a watched pot will never boil. And what that means is that if you keep your eye on, on whatever you're boiling in a pot, what you're cooking, what, what you're cooking, what, you, you, what you're cooking, and you don't want it to boil. If you, if you keep your eye on it and you're watching for the signs, when the little bubbles start coming on up, you take your pot off the stove and you, you keep it from burning that way. A watched pot will never boil. And if, you, if you're not watching for it, if you walk away and do other things, it can, you can miss it. You, you need to keep looking at what's happening. You need to be anticipating that it's going to boil and you need to be watching for the signs and then uh, make sure you don't miss it and take that pot off the heat so that it doesn't get wrecked or that you don't miss it. Well, that happens, that happens to apply to what we're talking about today because you know what Jesus has come Jesus was born in Bethlehem and we haven't missed it we were watching for him to come for four weeks of Advent we were watching the signs and we made sure that we did not miss it and we anticipated waiting for Jesus to come but what we have to do is we have to remember that Jesus is with us every day now. And we have to not forget that he is walking with us and his, he is living with us. And our life is fulfilled because Jesus is closer to us than even the breath we take. You know, the scripture that goes along with the first Sunday in Christmas is one that talks about an old man and an old woman. The man's name was Simeon, and the woman's name was Anna. And they had lived their whole lives waiting for the Messiah to come. And when Jesus was brought to the synagogue by Mary and Joseph, when he was only eight days old, they saw him, and they knew he was the Messiah because they had been waiting and waiting and watching for him. They didn't miss him. And then their lives were fulfilled because they knew that that was the Messiah. The Messiah had been born. So boys and girls, let's live our lives showing that we know it. We know that Jesus has been born and lives with us every day. All right? Let's pray. Gracious and God, gracious God, we do thank you that Jesus is with us. We have anticipated it. We know he's here. Help us to live our lives like that. Help us live knowing that he walks with us every day and that our lives are fulfilled because of it. We say this prayer in the name of Jesus, our Lord and our precious Savior. Amen. Let us now hear the special music, Coventry Carol and First Noel.
Once again, thank you so much. We have such lovely music. The prayer for illumination. Let us pray together. By the breath of your spirit, inspire us, O God, that in hearing your word we may be filled with new understanding and fresh desire to please you in all we do. For the sake of your Son, our precious Lord and Savior, the one who was born as a baby in Bethlehem, we pray. Amen. A reading from Psalm 148. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his host. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all you shining stars. Praise him, you highest heavens and you waters above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded and they were created. He established them forever and ever. He fixed their bounds, which cannot be passed. Praise the Lord from the earth, you sea monsters and all deeps fire and hail, snow and frost, stormy wind fulfilling God's command, mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars, wild animals and all cattle, creeping things and flying birds. Brothers and sisters in Christ, grace to you and peace from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I live in Minnesota where at this time of year during the Christmas season, we often have snow and blizzards and ice. We have what my colleague Caroline Lewis at Luther Seminary calls the unnecessary freezing of water. So if you ever encountered a snowstorm or an ice storm and you could give them one message, what would that message be? Would you quote the words of St. Peter to Jesus or rather of Jesus to St. Peter and say, get thee behind me, Satan? Is that what you'd say to a snowstorm? Would you draw on Shakespeare and say, if you be not mad, be gone. If you have logic, be brief. Or would you resort to some more colloquial turn of phrase that I can't really quote in a sermon? But imagine you could speak a word to a blizzard. What would you say? My guess is the first thing that came to your mind was probably not what the psalm writer in Psalm 148 says to the snowstorm, praise the Lord. The psalmist turns to the snowstorm and he turns to the hail and wind and says, join me and praise the Lord. It's a really odd thing that we find here uh, in Psalm 148 and how the psalm addresses this unnecessary freezing that is part of winter. Praise the Lord from the earth, you sea monsters and all deeps, fire and hail, snow and frost, stormy wind fulfilling his command. Praise the Lord. So what are we supposed to make of this odd call? Is it just a poetic flourish whereby nature is addressed sort of anthropomorphically as if it were a human being in order to underscore just the point that we all should be praising the Lord? Well, it could be that. It's at least that, but it might be something more. Because the call to praise the Lord, which is found here and elsewhere in the book of Psalms and in the book of Isaiah, has an important theological message for those of us living in the modern world. The call to praise the Lord bears witness to God's urgent and ongoing commitment to be reconciled, not only to human beings, but also to be reconciled to the entire rebellious creation. In the New Testament, St. Paul affirms both that the entire creation was subject to futility and that, quote, the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains and also that through Christ, God was renewing creation in Paul's world, word, quote, creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay. In the Old Testament, creation itself is likewise understood as being in rebellion against God. Not just human beings, but all of creation is understood as rebelling against God. And especially in the Psalms, the waters of the sea, the waters of chaos, 
which are portrayed as a manifestation of the rebelling creation against God's purposes are called to praise the Lord. In Psalm 148 is probably the most famous of these passages. So two things about, uh, about this word of praise that is spoken to the rebellious creation. First of all, it's important to note that praise is always polemical in the Old Testament. Praise is polemical because it is saying there's only one God to be praised, not others, and that all the other things that exist are not the true God. For that reason, this Psalm 148, which we have here in winter, at least in the northern hemisphere, and which especially is uh, at Christmas, it's an important word at Christmas time because we believe that the one true God took on human flesh and dwelt among us in Jesus of Nazareth. Praise is polemical because it says God alone is God. Quite a few, uh, quite a few years ago now, I was making a hospital call on a parishioner, and it happened in an old hospital. I ran into a friend as I was on the way to visit uh, the, per the parishioner who was sick, and I stopped and I was introduced to another person, a woman who was talking to this friend, and then I went down the hallway. When I got there, the parishioner had already been discharged, so about 30 seconds later, I came rolling back down the hall, and uh, my friend said, hey, why, what's so quick? And I said, well, the person's already been sent home. Now, um, it's going to help you uh, listeners to the sermon if you know two things. I'm a Lutheran, and the woman who was uh, standing next to my friend is not. This next story should make it clear. So I say, the person has already been sent home, and right then, the woman that uh, was with my friend, she grabbed both of our hands, grabbed me by one hand, grabbed uh, the mutual friend by another hand, and said, let's praise the Lord. And then right there, in the middle of the hallway of Midway Hospital, St. Paul, Minnesota, she stopped and praised the Lord. Now, as, I, as I've already said, I'm a Lutheran. We don't do that. It made me just really uncomfortable. And uh, I don't know uh, what uh, flavor of Christian uh, that woman was, but I know because it's, she stopped and praised God, like in front of people, not in church, I know she wasn't a Lutheran. At first, it really made me feel uncomfortable. It kind of made my skin crawl because, like I said, we don't do that. But the more and the longer I thought about that moment, the more grateful I am that this woman stopped to praise God in the middle of the hallway. Because that word praise God or praise the Lord is basically a claim that the God who was born in human flesh at Christmas is the one true God and all other claims to lordship over us are false. The word praise the Lord is a call. It announces that the Lord is God and no one else is, and that therefore all of those petty tin gods and would-be lords of this world that claim us, they are shams. It's a testimony, praise is a testimony that asserts that life and health and every good come not from our own selves or from the doctors, who heal us and the bankers who invest our money, from the captains of industry who employ us or the military that protects us. It's a claim that God alone is the source of all good things in our life. When that woman praised God in the midst of everyday life all those years ago, she took the comfortable words of praise that we say in worship and she used them in the hallway of Midway Hospital. She was saying that the one who was born at Christmas, who was later died, who was later crucified for our sins and was raised from the dead, that person is the same person who cast down Pharaoh in Egypt, who brought Israel through the sea on dry land, and who still claims you and loves you today. That's the first thing about praise to know. Praise is polemical. A second thing about praise is to note that Praise is relational. Praise is about a relationship between us and our God. Notice here that Psalm 148, when it says to nature and the snowstorm and the blizzard, praise the Lord, it is in the midst of a Christmas season when so many of our hymns talk about nature. Uh, let me just read you a few of uh, my favorite lines that pick up this theme in the Christmas season of nature praising God. 
My favorite Christmas hymn, Joy to the World, when we sing that hymn, we sing that fields and floods, rocks, hills, and plains should repeat the sounding joy of our and the angels' praise at the birth of Christ. And also, it says in Joy to the World, no more let sin and sorrow reign, nor thorns infest the ground. In the Advent Christmas carol, excuse me, the Advent carol, All Earth is Hopeful, we sing, quote, All earth is hopeful, the Savior comes at last. Furrows lie open for God's creative task. We should remember that at Christmas, it's not only our hearts that are open to the birth of the Christ child, but the furrows of the prairie and of the mountains, they are open to God's creative task also. One more example from angels from the realms of glory in the last stanza we sing, all creation join in praising God, the Father, Spirit, Son, evermore your voice is raising to the eternal 3E1. Isn't that interesting? All creation should raise their voice. When I was a pastor many years ago, I, I, I called on a, an elderly couple on Christmas Eve. I was out uh, making help, uh, calls to the homebound before the Christmas Eve service. And uh, the woman uh, in that uh, couple um, talked about growing up on a farm in Minnesota where I live. And she said that on Christmas Eve, um, on her farm, they didn't go to the services. They went to worship. But they would go out um, into the farmyard and listen to the bells that called the worshipers to worship on Christmas Eve. And then she said on Christmas Eve, they would give an extra half measure of food to all the animals so that the animals could join in the, uh, in the rejoicing and the feasting of creation too. A helpful thing, I think, to remind ourselves that God comes not only to redeem us and be reconciled to us, but also that God promises to remake and recreate everything in creation one day. As I've already said, the call to praise in Psalm 148 is evidence of God's commitment to be reconciled to the rebellious creation. It's helpful here to remember that in addition to being polemical, praise is also a relational act. When we praise God, we praise directly to God as part of our relationship between ourselves and our creator. Praise puts us back in communication with God. Uh, praise transforms the rebellious part of our speech, the part in which we say, no, I want to know good from evil. I want to be my own Lord. I want to be God of my own life. It takes that no of, uh, of, our, of our resistance to God and it turns it into this. Your name, O oh God, is exalted. Your name alone. One of the reasons we are called to praise God is it's part of our relationship with God in which we acknowledge that not only is God the one God of all creation, but that God is my Lord, that the one born at Christmas is my Savior and my King. When I praise God, I acknowledge both to God and to others and to myself that I am not the Lord of my own life. I do not secure my own path. I am not my own guide. I am not my own Savior, Creator, or Redeemer. When I praise God, I acknowledge to God and to others that the Lord is my Lord. Jesus is my head. Praise is thus a relational and liturgical action that turns us away from ourselves to God, and it works to untwist the curved in upon itself nature of our sinful hearts. I had an old teacher named Jim Nestigan who, uh, who taught me church history, and he used to say that in praise, we enter into a proper alignment with God. And he used, the, he, uh, he used the image of the spokes of a bicycle wheel that once we, we true them, that you can tighten up those spokes and it, it makes them straighter and tight. And that's what praise does. Praise trues our heart so that we are in proper relationship with our Savior by acknowledging that he is our Lord and we belong to him. And that is all the more reason to praise God during this Christmas season.
Friends, let us now affirm what we believe using the Apostles' Creed. If you are able to stand wherever you are, please join with me in saying the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead, and he ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please join with me now as we come before our Lord in the pastoral prayer, the prayer, prayers of the people. Let us pray. Holy One, today, who, who came, we know, as a child, we come before you to pray for your children everywhere. We pray for your children who are hungry. We pray for nourishment. We pray for those who are fleeing, and we pray for their safety. We pray for those children who are ill. We pray for your healing. We pray for those who are grieving, and we pray for your hand of peace upon them. We pray for those who are suffering. We pray for your presence. Holy three, who patterns community, we pray for communities everywhere. We pray for those who are divided. We pray for unity. For those who are isolated, we pray for connection. For those who are afraid, we pray for your courage. For those who are frustrated, we pray for new hope. We pray especially for those of our own community who suffer this day. We lift to you those on our prayer list. We pray for John and Bill and Marjorie and Chaplain D and her mother. For Jim, for Brad, for Trinity, for Tricia and Mary. For Elisa, for Shushen, for Jack, Zach, for Carol, Sarah. We pray for our troops, for Bonham and Jake and Stephen and Chris and Sarah and Jonathan and Brandon and Cristobal 
and Richard and Michael and Troy and Daniel. We pray for others that you know, Lord, now in the silence. We pray thanking you for our many blessings. We pray especially for those who celebrate great days this week. We pray for those celebrating anniversaries, Janet Ojung and Ojung Are, for those celebrating birthdays, Jameson and Josephate. Let them feel your presence with them and their, your pleasure, Lord. Let them know what treasures they are to you and to us. Let them have not only a glorious day, but a glorious year. Holy God of our past, our present, and our future, as the calendar turns and we greet another year this week, we ask not so much for answers to those questions that perplex us, for the past year has been difficult, but we ask for confidence in your never-failing care for us as we go forward in hope for a kinder, healthier, more just, and lovelier world. We begin the year with gratitude for the moments and the milestones in which we experienced your presence this past year and your goodness at work in the midst of hardship. Nourish us on the abundance of your grace, the generosity of your mercy, and the unwavering promise of your compassion. We pray all of these things in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to say as we pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, let's now sing the hymn of the church, Go Tell It on the Mountain. Sing it like you know it. Christ is born, and in the morning. 
wishing that blessed Christmas morn. <coughs> Tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Oh, tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. So friends, go now in joy and in peace. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Hallelujah. Amen. Happy New Year.
take the professor out of him, don't you? No. <laughs>